You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your hosts, Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich. Good evening. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 1, page 62. That's right. I am Sir Reginald Outfield. And I am Lord Bigglesby Anklevich. And this week, we bring you Raising Archie by Michael Stone. Michael Stone was born in 1966 in Stoke-on-Trent, England. Since losing most of his eyesight to Usher Syndrome, he has retreated from your world to travel the dark corners of inner space. To put it more prosaically, he daydreams a lot. Michael's work has appeared in numerous publications. In 2008, Baysgarth Publications published Foretold, a collection of his novellas, with a foreword by award-winning fantasist Gary Kilworth. It's available through the usual outlets. If you fancy a signed hardcover, contact him via his website, www.myleftei.net. This story was first published at electricspec.com in 2006. It is copyright Michael Stone. Hope you enjoy it. Raising Archie by Michael Stone The trilling dragged me through several layers of warm slumber. I sat up and swept the bedside cabinet with the flat of my hand, before realizing I didn't need my glasses to answer a phone. Brenda turned to face me, concerned. Dead of night calls are not the norm in our household. Hello? Dave? What's that, mate? You've got a what? Okay, well, I'm sure it can wait until tomorrow. I checked the glowing red digits of the clock radio and corrected myself. Later today. Good night. I put the phone down. Brenda murmured. What did he want, James? Well, it's all a bit odd, really. Dave had seen a listing on an auction website for some kind of big egg. No description to speak of, but a few left clicks and thirty pounds and one penny later, the egg was his. Now, apparently, an animal had hatched. He wanted to show me his new pet. I picked the phone up and dialed. I'll be there in twenty minutes, mate. Ugh, you burk. Brenda said and rolled over. I shrugged, unable to explain the contagious excitement, the sense of curiosity awakening in the marrow of my thirty-nine-year-old bones. A feeling that quickly dissipated in the frigid night air as I drove over to Dave's house. All the windows of his semi-detached glowed in the blue blackness. This, I thought as I slammed the car door and walked up the path, had better be good. Dave snatched open the front door, dragged me in, then shut it behind me. I started to complain, but he spun me around. You've got to help me find him. The little sod disappeared while I was on the phone to you. Whatever you do, watch you don't tread on him. He's gray and... He made a fist. But it's so big. He dashed up the stairs, leaving me blinking in the harsh light of the hall. I sauntered into the lounge and found shards of dull gray eggshell nestling in cotton on a glass coffee table. I examined a piece. Less than a half an inch across, the shard was both thicker and heavier than its chicken counterpart. I sniffed it and detected a faint scent that reminded me of school days. After a few moments, I identified the smell of chalk. Dave had thoughtfully rigged a heat lamp. I angled the light obliquely across the glass tabletop and noticed a few motes of dust glinting on one edge. Encouraged, I picked up the lamp and, as far as the lead would allow, followed a dusty trail across the carpet. It ended in a small drift of whitish powder in an inner corner of the room. I looked up. Oh, very funny. Dave! He crashed down the stairs. What, what? Have you found him? He followed my eyes to where a putty-hued face peeked from a ragged hole in the plaster cornicing. Stone me! Dave smiled. Oh well, at least that confirms what he is. You are kidding me, right? Dave sat down on the sofa and watched the stone gargoyle do nothing, as stone gargoyles invariably do. What do you think gargoyles eat? He asked. I shrugged. 
While I felt annoyed about leaving my warm, comfortable bed to witness such an elaborate hoax, I found myself humoring him just to see how long he would keep up the pretense. The hole he'd knocked in the cornicing alone demanded a level of respectful cooperation from me. How about coal, Jimbo? Maybe. I saw on telly once that some birds nibble their eggshells for vital minerals and stuff. Dave plucked a shard of broken shell from the coffee table and offered it up to the gargoyle. When the piece wasn't snatched from his fingers, he rested it on the lip of the hole and sat down again. I said, The shell seems to be made of chalk, Dave. I don't suppose you happen to have any chalk lying around, do you? Yeah, there's some in the middle drawer over there. He indicated the sideboard with his chin. Pass him one, Jimbo. Go on. I opened the drawer. A packet of blackboard chalk lay among a mess of staples, paper clips, rubber bands, pencils, and biros. How convenient, I said. How do you mean, mate? Never mind. I slid a chalk stick from the packet and offered it to the gargoyle. A piece of eggshell was protruding from its mouth. How? I looked at Dave. He beamed. You were dead right about the eggshell. I placed the chalk next to the gargoyle and walked backwards to my chair, staring at the ugly stone head. Dave rose and peered closer at the thing. While his head blocked my view, I heard a distinct crunch. He jerked back and exploded with laughter. Look at him go! He likes that! I jumped up to stand beside him. <laughs> the chalk, like the eggshell, had gone. Dave said, I think I'll call him... I don't know. What should I call him? I reached up and prodded the creature's face. Stone. Solid, immovable stone. Dave, listen, did, did you actually see... No, I meant to say, do you think you saw that thing eating? Yeah, didn't you? No! I was growing agitated. Curious. I wonder if it only moves when it thinks it's not being watched. Me accepting, of course. I suppose he thinks I'm mummy. I clapped my friend on the back. He's got your nose. Bog off. Anyway, what should I call him? I don't know. Boredom was replacing agitation. How about Archie? Why Archie? Why not? <laughs> Can't argue with that. Does look like an Archie, doesn't he? Yeah, Archie the Gargoyle. I like that. Nice one, Jimbo. Look, as much as I'd like to stay and look at a garden ornament that you've embedded in your wall, and as much as I admire the trouble you've gone to in setting that little lot up, I indicated the remains of the egg on the coffee table, I'm going home. I waited for Dave to relent. I'd played my part. Surely he could drop the act now? Okay. Thanks for coming. I know it's late, but I just had to show someone. He is amazing, isn't he? His ingenuous gaze met mine. I shook my head and left. Dave related his diet experiments. He'd invested in a cement mixer and tried various combinations of sand, cement, and gravel. Although Archie liked sticks of chalk fed by hand, Dave guessed that an exclusive diet of chalk would not be healthy for a growing gargoyle. I sat on an upturned bucket in Dave's yard and smoked a cigarette while he shoveled more sand into the mixer. What's on the menu today, mummy? Two pots fine gravel and sand to one pot cement with just a hint of silica and graphite for seasoning. I've told him if he eats it all, and only if he eats it all, he can have two chalk sticks as a special treat. I'm trying to wean him off the chalk. Isn't that right, Archie? Archie, squatting before a smaller bucket, reacted with stoic indifference. He was, I noticed, a slightly larger figurine than the one I'd seen a week before. More canine. He had a muzzle and pointed upright ears. A rough tongue protruded from fluted lips. How long are you going to keep this up, Dave? He turned Archie's dinner a couple of revolutions before adding water from a hose pipe. Keep what up, mate? This. I mean, what did the neighbours think? As a local planning officer, I was accustomed to disgruntled citizens complaining about their neighbours. Do you take him walkies? I take him out in the car up Stratford Hills. He hates being watched, and it's nice and quiet up there. Not too many folks about after eight. He's learning to fly. I looked at Archie's stunted wings and grunted. I ride around on my bike, and he follows, flapping his wings and trying to keep up. His face became animated when he talked about his pet gargoyle. I wish you'd come and watch. Maybe I will someday, I said, meaning not on your life, pal. 
I wasn't buying any of it. But hey, he was within his rights to be eccentric. Eccentricity was a noble British trait. Someone should have slapped a preservation order on him and paid him his dues for keeping old traditions alive. I smiled as he tipped some sandy gruel into Archie's bucket and patted the statue fondly on the head. I enjoyed the role of passive observer, but the milk of kindness flowing through my veins was somewhat soured by the niggling question of why he had chosen me to take for a ride. Three weeks later, I put the same question to my wife over our evening meal. Because he knows you'll humor him, that's why. Brenda forked the last scrap of cauliflower into her mouth and folded her cutlery on her plate. Anyone else would have called in the men in white coats ages ago. Well, that's a bit harsh, isn't it? Mind you, he's making a hell of a mess of his house. Archie's this tall. I held my hand two feet off the ground. And yet he still climbs. No, Dave still puts him up in the corner of the lounge wall. The hole's massive. All the plaster work's gone. It won't be long before Archie's arse pokes out the exterior wall. She narrowed her eyes. Have you asked yourself, what is Dave getting out of all of this? I think it's a game to him, like chess or something. Every time I go round, he plays it like Archie is real, alive. How the hell do you argue with someone when he tells you he keeps a grotesque statue as a pet? Perhaps, if you could find some incriminating evidence, like gargoyle molds in his shed? Oh, do you think I haven't looked? There are no molds. And if he had the necessary skills to sculpt one, I'm pretty sure he couldn't carve successively larger ones at the rate he'd have to. Archie gets a little bigger each week, like he's growing. Are you sure it's made of stone and not some sort of fiberglass with polystyrene? It's stone, all right. Dave's being very crafty about all this. Either that or... Or what? I retreated under Brenda's scrutiny. Nothing. He's taking you for an idiot, James. He wouldn't do that. Not deliberately. We go way back, Dave and I. Give him an ultimatum. Either he stops messing you about, or you call in the men in white coats. But he's a mate, and he's not harming anyone, is he? I wouldn't expect you to understand. It's a bloke thing. We mates stick together. I'm telling you now, James. Stop calling me James. What? She said, derailed by my sudden change of direction. I said, stop calling me James, please. But that's your name. Yes, I am aware of that. Brenda took our plates into the kitchen. I knew she didn't understand my little outburst. I wasn't sure I understood it either. I'd set out on life's road as little Jimmy. Entered my teens as Jimmy and exited them as Jim. Somewhere in my late twenties, I morphed into James. People had called me James with a sort of mock seriousness, winking at my inevitable slide into middle age. Only Dave called me Jimbo, and he did so without a trace of sarcasm. I twiddled my thumbs and stared at the tablecloth, hoping I hadn't jeopardized my chances of dessert. Thursday meant sticky toffee pudding, my favorite. Brenda switched the radio on in the kitchen. All I'm saying... She said, raising her voice above that of Matt Munro's. Is that sometimes you have to be cruel to be kind. Dave and I were sitting in his lounge on a pleasant summer evening. The windows flung open to birdsong, ice cream van chimes, and the clatter of lawnmowers as homo suburbia tamed squares of nature. I waved a tin of lager at the statue in the corner. He's looking a little cramped there, Dave. Do you think so? He seems happy enough to me. But are you being fair to him? I persisted. Think about it. His natural environment is up on a church roof or a cathedral somewhere, looking out over grand vistas. Baked by the sun one day, rhymed with hoarfrost the next. This corner of your lounge, Dave, it's, it's not natural for such a noble creature. He took a thoughtful sip of his beer. And, I continued, you have no way of knowing how big he's going to get. I mean... Are gargoyles like poodles? Do they come as miniature, toy, and standard? What are you going to do if he keeps on growing? What is he now, three foot? Three foot six? Dave straightened. I know. I'll build a small church in the garden. Nothing fancy, just enough for Archie to sit on and feel at home. You cannot be serious. Why not? Because you'd never get planning permission for a start. He smiled. Well, I've got this friend who works in the planning department of the local council. No way, Dave. Forget it. You'd be asking me to compromise my integrity. People who think they can just bypass regulations by bunging a planning officer a few quid. I deal with that sort of crap every day. I certainly didn't expect it from you. Dave eased back in his chair. No, Jimbo, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, well, 
A church in your garden is a stupid idea anyway. I took a photocopy from my top pocket and flattened it out on the coffee table. Listen, I've been doing some research at work. There's this church in Fulwin... Uh, Fulwin... It's in Wales. It dates back nearly 500 years. I swiveled the paper so Dave could see it. It's covered in carvings of masks, gargoyles, weirdy beasties. So? So he would be among his own kind. This is where he belongs, out there in the open. It would be perfect. Look, I'll leave this here with you. Think about it, mate. You're going to have to come to some sort of decision about what to do with him sooner or later. You've known that all along, haven't you? Dave shrugged. He's becoming reliant on you, I said. You've done a great job bringing up so far, but leave it too long and he's not going to be able to fend for himself in the wild. He needs to be among his own kind, Dave. Let him go. It's a kindness. It's just that I'll miss him. And I'm sure he'll miss you. The church of St. Ilfew overlooked farmland to the east and north, the graveyard and a narrow country lane to the west, and a caravan park to the south. Once we had located the village of the Luanuagagog, the church had been easy to find. Three grotesque gargoyles topped a solid squat tower thrusting into the darkening sky. Contorted faces peered at us from every surface. I pulled into the lane leading to the caravan park and climbed out to open the gate, the salt tang in the air reminding me that we were near the coast. Archie will like it here, I thought, and then shook my head at the unconscious slip. Once we were in the park, I lifted the rear door and reached for Archie. Come on, Dave, let's get this over with before it gets too dark to see. The last thing we need is for someone to come along and start asking us daft questions. Or questions that would solicit daft answers. I slid the stone effigy along the floor and tipped it over. Dave appeared at my side. Careful with him! He took the head and I grabbed the feet. On the count of three, I said. One, two, three, lift! Due to the confined space, I failed to raise Archie over the tailgate. There was the painful screech of stone dragging on metal, and I was looking at a nasty scratch in my paintwork. Oh, for crying out loud! Dave elbowed me aside. Leave me to it, Jimbo. There's no way you'll get him out by yourself. He huffed, as if dealing with a wayward child. Archie will get out the same way he got in, by himself. Just bog off and leave us alone. I bogged off. First I sought out the toilets, then took a wander around the park. Brenda had talked often about us getting a caravan for weekends away. The Luanuagagog looked a good place to stay. Pleasantly pastoral, historical, romantic even, but the swarming gnats drove such thoughts away and me back to the car. Dave had managed to manhandle Archie out onto the grass and was squatting before the stone effigy. I strode around to the back of the car to close the door when I saw a chip of masonry just inside the tailgate. A claw. I must have knocked it off the gargoyle on our abortive attempt to get it out. Still annoyed at the scratch in the paintwork, I slipped the claw into my pocket and banged the door down. How long are you going to be, Dave? He looked drawn. I'm sure if the light had been better, I would have seen tears coursing over his cheeks. Embarrassed, I said, I'm going to turn the car around and make ready to go. Come when you're ready. Then, because it seemed the decent thing to do, I said goodbye to Archie. I opened the gate, got in the car, and headed back down the narrow lane. I pulled over onto the grass verge and switched off the engine. All was quiet. In my mirror, I could just make out the silhouette of St. Ilfuse against the purple sky. A handful of stars twinkled. Three, four minutes passed. I rolled the window down and stuck my head out. I was just about to holler for Dave to get his arse into gear when I heard a scream. The fuzzy hairs on the back of my neck stood on end. A thick silence descended. I began to wonder if I had imagined the cry. Then came a rhythmic sound, hard, like leather on rock. I was out of the car and running toward the park when Dave came charging down the lane. Get going, Jimbo. Please, just get going. I opened my mouth to argue, but the anguish on his face stilled my tongue. I spun around and jumped in the driver's seat. What the hell happened? I asked once we were moving. Dave struggled for breath. He wouldn't stay. I couldn't make him understand. He, he had to stay. At first he seemed interested in the church tower. He flew up and had a sniff around the other gargoyles. But then he flew back down and started following me off the park. I turned on him and raised my arms, shouted at him. Yeah! He just looked at me, 
with his head on one side as if to say, What's up with you? He couldn't understand why I was leaving him. What was that noise I heard? Probably me slapping him. Dave smiled through his tears. I don't know who it hurt more, me or him. It is for the best, isn't it, Jimbo? I have done the right thing. Yes, mate, you have. Don't forget your seatbelt. We sped away, game over. Checkmate to me. I'd only made one move in the entire game, but I had outmaneuvered him. I hope the other gargoyles accept him, Dave said quietly. A shiver went down my back. He was acting, of course. He had to be acting. I had to believe he was acting because the alternative, that my friend had gone completely bonkers, was too frightening to contemplate. The car headlights framed Dave's house as we pulled into the drive. I turned the engine off. Any chance of a cuppa? I'm parched. Hmm? Dave said. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I was miles away. Dave walked up his drive and I followed. He stopped suddenly and peered into the bushes fringing the garden. What was that? What was what, I said. I didn't hear anything. Dave crossed the lawn in three strides and parted a red barberry. There, glowing dully in the feeble light of a street lamp, was Archie. Dave dropped to his knees and threw his arms around the gargoyle. I ground my teeth. How the hell do you explain that? Dave turned to face me. It's Archie! He flew home! On those little wings? I hammered my head with my hands. No, no, no. I'm getting as bad as you. He can't fly because he's a statue. We left a hunk of bloody rock in Wales two hours ago, and now there's another one near garden. It's not fair, Dave. You're not playing by the rules. I beat you fair and square. I'm sick of this whole bloody charade, this, this, this farce. I ran across the lawn and kicked the statue before collapsing, clutching what felt like five broken toes. Ya bugger! Dave watched me without moving. Game, Jimbo. I don't know what you mean. He nodded at the gargoyle. That's my Archie. I sat up. It is not your Archie. You must have made it and put it there before we left. Come on, Dave, I said miserably. Why not admit it? This has gone on long enough. He shook his head. I had no idea. I pushed myself to my feet and hobbled to face him. Dave, I want you to tell me truthfully now. Do you really believe that you have a pet gargoyle and that he flew over 80 miles back to your house tonight? Yes. I grasped his hand and shook it. And that's it, mate. I can't deal with it. You're out of my depth. Brenda was right. You should be seeking professional help. Where are you going? I thought you wanted a cuppa. I was limping down the drive. I'm going home, Dave. Perhaps I'll see you around. I fumbled in my coat pocket for the keys. Something hard dug into my finger. I spun around. Last chance, mate. Admit I beat you fair and square. It's not a game. I keep telling you. Oh, yes it is, I crowed. And what's more, I've won. I marched back with as much dignity as bruised toes would allow and flashed my trump card. What's that? It's a claw. It came off the gargoyle we left behind at St. Iofu's. I bent down to the statue in the bushes and examined its feet. So, whereas that one is short a claw, this one... Oh. Within three months, Dave's garden had become a trench. I left Brenda in his kitchen and ducked as a digger bucket narrowly missed my head. Sorry, Jim, the operator called down. No worries, I shouted back. Where's Dave? He pointed to the pavement where Dave was facing down a clearly irate neighbor. I ambled over to mediate. Good morning, gentlemen. It would be a better morning if this law packed up and went home. Ah, you wouldn't be Mr. Wapkiss by any chance. The man eyed me warily. That's me. I turned to Dave. You go and supervise the workmen. He didn't need telling twice. Dave trotted off to a safe distance. This building is going to be an eyesore, grumbled Mr. Watkiss. Well, you're welcome to your opinion, of course, but the fact remains that the occupant of this property has been given full approval by the local planning department. Aye, uh, I know. I phoned them up. Fella there gave me some guff about exemptions for certain types of buildings. My card, 
I handed him my office number. What's this? He frowned. You. Listen to me, you smart arse. You're going to regret this. One phone call to your superiors and... There won't be a phone call to my superiors, Mr. Watkiss, from you or anyone else. Oh, I. We'll see about that. Is that your house over there? I gestured down the street. It's just that I've noticed it has a recent loft conversion that's not on our files. I let him absorb the ramifications before raising my eyebrows and politely asking if there was anything else he cared to discuss. He stamped away, muttering. Dave clapped me on the back. I owe you on there, Jimbo. Thanks. Think nothing of it, mate. I had no idea compromising my integrity could be so much fun. We surveyed the battlefield of his front lawn where he had been permitted to build a chapel. Fortunately for Dave, the planning officer who received his application had uncovered a little-known statute allowing an exemption for building line infringements if the building was religious in purpose. I only hoped no one ever asked me more about it. I'd have to write the statute. Brenda came out of the kitchen carrying a plate of beef sandwiches. Dave and I grabbed two each. Thanks, Brenda. She took the rest to the workman. Your Brenda's been a real brick, Jimbo. It's funny, but I've never really got to know her that well. You'll have to bring her around more often. Does she know about... He tipped his head at Archie, who was sitting by the back door watching the construction of his new home. Kind of. She will, given time. Dave sauntered off, humming contentedly. I fished in my pocket for a stick of chalk and placed it in the gargoyle's muzzle. Don't tell Mummy I'm feeding you these, I said and chuckled as a rough tongue licked the dust off my fingers. Author's Note Hello, I'm Michael Stone. The Junestiff guys have asked me to say a few words about the story you just listened to. Raising guards who grew out of an idea kicked around for a long time about a guy who buys a mysterious egg. I wrote a scene where he puts the egg down on a nest of cotton wool, set up a heater and waited. The poor sap had to wait nearly a year while I figured what would hatch out. A dragon? Hardly original. A dinosaur then? Hmm, some potential, but like the dragon idea, I felt it wasn't very original. So I considered various mythical creatures, a phoenix, a griffin, or a manticore, or how about Keira Knightley or Jessica Alba? Hmm. In the end I went for the gargoyle. I've no idea where the narrator's middle of crisis angle came from. Alright, so we're back. I am Lord Bigglesby Anglovich. And this is Sir Reginald Outfield. If you're new to the podcast, every week or so we bring you a short story that is submitted by you, the uh, listener. And I meant listener, singular. Right, yes, 223 Crescent Circle. Thank you, sir. And uh, we are always on the lookout for more stories to (laughs) read and share with the audience of one. How uh, can they get us those stories, Lord Bigglesby? Thank you, Sir Reginald. The email address, submissions at doonstief.com. Please stop by our website and take a look at our submission guidelines before sending us that story. Because we want to be in control of you and make you do things the way we like it. And he's not kidding, folks. I've known this man for a good long time, and uh, he uh, has quite a large anklevage. Anyhow, <laughs> as you can tell from listening to the story this week, we are not... From the uh, great land of England. I uh, like to do several voices. I like to do accents. I like to do impressions. But keeping it up for a full story, that was a challenge. Yeah, very difficult. And I, you know, I want to apologize to Mr. Stone if uh, you know, in some ways we didn't do justice to his, his fine country. I'm an Anglophile myself, and I wish that, uh, I wish that were my real accent. It's not. Lord Bigglesby did email him and warn him that we were going to mangle the proper British tongue. And especially mangle the Welsh (laughs) that we were forced to speak. Folks, if you had access to the full director's cut of Raising Archie, 
you would hear a lot of profanity and a lot of exasperation at the pronunciation of Thuluinigagog. Is that what it was? Thuluinigagog? That's right. See, your guess is as good as mine. Being from across the pond to you, Mr. Stone, you know, there's a lot of uh, grief that we hear about American actors not being able to pull off an English accent. Uh, the one that always comes to mind for me is uh, poor Kevin Costner in Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves. Now, that movie came out in 91, and before 91 was through, everybody had had a chance to make fun of his English accent, as small as it is throughout that movie. <laughs> we actually have a sample of that. Okay. My father was no devil worshipper, and I'll have words with any man who says otherwise. Thank you, Kevin. Very nice. You know, the guy gets a lot of grief from that. My uncle still insists that Kevin Costner's not a good actor. And, and you know, there are some actors. Uh, Gwyneth Paltrow does a really good English accent. Robert Downey Jr., really good English accent. Sting, I've, I've heard. Yeah, really he has a nice accent. one. You know, i got to be honest. It bothers me when a Brit or an Aussie tries to do an American accent and you can tell that that's a made up accent. Yeah, when you can hear it when you when you hear it sneaking through it's it's the same thing. You know what I was thinking after having done this podcast and trying to struggle through the accent, I believe that I can do a English accent better than I can do other accents like an Australian accent. Australia, we love you. Amen. But what I can really do well, I believe is the various American accents. I can do a southern drawl. I can do a cowboy-type accent, or I could do a Brooklyn kind of an accent. Far simpler, and I think far more convincing than I could ever get away with something like that. I, I don't know if, if that has something to do with it. Maybe a Brit can do the various... A Geordie you know, accent, or a Cockney right, accent. Right, a Geordie, or a Cockney, or a, even Scottish... But then going to American it would be more difficult. I don't know. I mean, you've told me your experience on working with Dr. House and what he does. That's true. Okay. Yeah, I worked on House MD in the second season over at the Fox uh, studio lot. And every single day that I worked on that, Hugh Laurie would speak just like his character. He would speak with his an American accent, you know, when he was getting food or when he was talking to the director or whoever happened to be around. So when I saw him interviewed later, and, and he had this, this plum English accent, I, it was hard for me to accept because I, I had seen the guy in person, and he didn't talk that way. But I, in the interviews, he said that you know he gets into character, and he talks that way from noon to uh, uh, till noon 05. For, for, for five minutes, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's something he does to loosen up his, his cheeks. No. Uh, he just he does it to keep himself in the character and to keep that as a natural speaking voice, and that really really impressed me. I mean, made me uh, respect him as an actor all the more. And you know, there are some great actors out there who, uh, like like Con Sean Connery, his American accent is pretty darn close to his Russian accent from Hunt for Red October. <laughs> Today we sail into history, and uh, I always mock uh, Sir Anthony Hopkins as great as he is. I thought for years that Hannibal Lecter was from Wales, was that he was supposed to have some English accent or whatever until later. Where, where is it that you told me he was from? Uh, he was, he's from Baltimore, I believe. And, and, yeah, that's funny. Uh, in Hearts in Atlantis, he, he says, little kids always think far too funny. And I was just like, what the crap is that? <laughs> you know, no, no, no offense I think that was his accent from, from his service with the Dark Tower. Ah, okay, well then... <laughs> I, I apologize, Sir Anthony. I, I could never. You could never have mastered that whole Dark Tower accent. It's tough. But and one other story I wanted to tell was uh, I interviewed Carolyn Blackston, who played Mon Mothma in Return of the Jedi, and I asked her. I said, "Hey, were you at all worried that your voice would be dubbed over by an American? Because in Return of the Jedi, unlike Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back, he Americanized some of the Brits, some of the." Imperial officers suddenly have an American accent, even though the actor didn't have it. And I asked her about it, but uh, she said, I, I, I don't know what you mean. Can we play the, the Emperor has made a critical error and the time for our attack has come? Can we play that? The Emperor has made a critical error and the time for our attack has come. 
She said that that was not an English accent, but that she had been doing something called a mid-Atlantic accent. Mid-Atlantic. Which is supposed to be like half English and half American, something in the middle. Isn't in between weird? American and British, is it? What is I, that, like Bermuda, Greenland? <laughs> if the emperor has made a critical error and the time for attack has come is not an English accent, then I just don't know anybody that talks like that. I used to think that Darth Vader had an English accent. How about you? I don't know. You really think Darth Vader? Well, it was Darth Vader in a Darth Vader voice and see if you can do it in an American cadence. What does Darth Vader say? Don't make me destroy you. Yeah, I guess it does sound kind of like, but we'll say, you do not yet realize your importance. That the way... Your you, sister. You know what I mean? And sister. That sounds to me like James Earl Jones doing an English accent. I don't know. Because in the last awful Star Wars prequel, when the trailer came out, you heard him say, Master. And I always thought, whoa, what the crap? Because Vader always said master. You know, he, yeah. it, it ended with an A-H. <laughs> that's right. But, yeah. you know, I could be wrong. Yeah, we could have somebody email us from Maine and say, uh, well, that's how people speak around here. Sometimes, Lewis, dead is better. So that was a big roundabout way of me trying to express how difficult it was yeah. to do the British accent. Basically a big roundabout way of us saying, hey, lay off. It's hard. You know, that's that's perfect, because that's exactly what I wasn't trying to do, but by making it sound like I had a plan, you're making me sound smarter than I am. You should not have come back. We do appreciate people listening. We do appreciate people sending in stories. Please continue to send them. And we have our PayPal button for donations, because we do pay the authors. Mr. Michael Stone is... I mean, he probably put all those bills on the floor and rolled around it because it was huge money. He put all those bill on the floor <laughs> and uh, right. rolled around in it. So <laughs> anyways, we do pay our authors and without donations, we won't be able to continue it for long. So please send a donation our way. And if you don't feel you can give a donation, then tell your friend about the stories. Because Mr. John Smith of 223 Crescent Court is getting lonely being the only listener. And believe me, I, I know all about lonely. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. You said uh, that they should, they should donate. And, you know, if you click on that PayPal button, you'll get to say, I pressed the button. And folks, that gives me so much joy. I'm welling up inside. Uh, at the same time, I know that not everybody loves our podcast. Uh, I can see the light is flashing. Oh, dear. Yes, it is. That means... It's time for the hate letter of the week. It looks like this is... this is It's your turn anyways, man. I think you better read that one. All right. Well, I, I get burned on these every single time <laughs> I read. Okay, so this week's hate letter says, Under-endowed, ashamed of your poor performance in bed, Tired of hearing complaints about your pathetic genitals or laughter at your ridiculously tiny schlong? Our amazing breakthrough product is guaranteed to add inches to your embarrassingly underdeveloped wang. For only $39.99, you can see a marked improvement in your sexual performance and as much as six whole inch... Wait, well, wait a second, dude. This is one of those, those spam emails that they send, you know, everybody it's trying to I... get them to buy some stupid... Uh, no. No, read that last part. Last part. Oh, this is about me. Um, keep those cards and letters coming, folks. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, if you want to send us a comment, a hate mail of the week, whatever. Or, or, or a compliment. <laughs> I don't know if that's going to happen, man. Just drop us a line, editor at doonstief.com, or just leave a comment on the blog. This has been Sir Reginald Outfield and Lord Bigglesby Anklevich advising you that good against remotes is one thing. Good against the living, that's something else. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.
The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. This means that you may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Thaluan <laughs> The Luan Nua, the Luan Nua, the Luan Nua Gagog, 